Folks, it is a pleasure and a treat to be here with you today. My name is Jocko van der Kooy. For those of you who are not familiar with it, this is going to be an entertaining session. And generally, uh, we're good to, uh, to engage with you. Um, the chat is operational, so we are looking at the chat. Whenever you see somebody ask a question, can you plus one it for me? Because that allows Siri and I to take a look at like, oh, that was a good question, right? And then when we see the plus one, we go back and we go like, what was that question? And then we can pull that to the front. So keep that chat. Also share best practices in the chat with each other. If you see something and you love it or you have experienced it before, you, you gotta say like, ah, I've seen that. Love all that stuff. Uh, all AI assistants. Um, here we go, all the AI assistants. I want you, all the ASI, AI recording assistants. I want you to ask Siri to ask Alexa, to ask Siri to ask Alexa, yes? Let's see if the AI assistants can keep track of that. Okay, with that said, um, we're here today to talk about the sweet spot in the eye of the storm. Um, it is a continue, it, this is a topic line. We have been doing this multiple times. So we are, um, you know, like, but this is, a, you're gonna see some new information and new insights today. We're gonna dive also in, 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 in a few things deeper. Where I wanna start off with, uh, you know, give you an idea and that we are, where are we in time right now? Because something, is, is happening. I'm gonna draw this analogy down here or on the left, right here, 1998. 1998 is when we got started, is when SaaS got started, is when Salesforce got started. It's one of those early, you know, it's like the conception birth time. You know, maybe 1998 was the conception and 2003 was the birth of, of SaaS. Um, when SaaS really became a VSB solution, started to surpass millions of dollars in revenue. And then in 2008, what you see there, um, you know, like during the economic collapse of the, the housing market, suddenly in CapEx is being imploding, suddenly we saw the rise of SaaS, primarily in the SMB market. 2003, I would argue, was the VSB market, small customers, four-person, five-person shops. And in 2008, it became the SMB market, 50 to 100-person company. We then started the golden age and the golden age came, I'll, I'll mark it you know, clearly because there was a date when Mark uh, Andreessen wrote the, 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 the prescient message about software eating the world. That started, that was an article came out on August 20, 2011. That golden age gave the rise of many SaaS uh, companies. And over the past decade, we've seen some of the largest SaaS companies. We have years with a hundred plus uh, uh, IPOs, you know, numerous, th over a thousand unicorns. I mean, it's been a fantastic decade. That is referred to as the golden age. December 3rd, 2021, that's the decade when one of the first major SaaS company, you know, had a huge fall in, in, in valuation. This was DocuSign on December the 3rd. We saw them as the first one being, again, prescient about what is about to happen. We are in that in-between period right now. I call it the Renaissance. We're at that point in time where we have left the golden age behind and we're entering a new age. That new age is what we're going to talk about. What is that new age? Where does it come from? What are we doing? That's the topic of today's session. And in particular, what you as a CRO need to do to prepare for that. And, and what I mean is prepare for that in the summer months. What do you need to do in the summer months? Because you need to be ready for this at the end of, of, of Q3, early Q4, so you can be in 2024, this thing is happening, right? Whether we want it or not, whether we like it or not, this thing is happening. I'm gonna give this in three specific descriptions. I'm gonna take you through three things. I'm gonna explain the situation with some of the few key points. We're gonna talk about a strategic matter, which is where we're spending a little, you know, like a reasonable amount of time on. And I'm gonna give you a few simple actions that you should consider to take. Now. I'm not here today to sell you anything on a major ideology or a thought. I'm not trying to tell you like, okay, you need to do it this way. What I'm trying to let you is to open your eyes. I'm trying to help you to see what is happening in the world. And I believe that if you gather all the same information that I have been gathering over the years, that you come to the same conclusion at some of these changes that we need to make. That's it. I just want you to like chill, sit back, understand what the heck is going on. Topic I'm gonna to talk about, first topic on the, on the schedule, on the agenda, situation. Here's what you're going to learn. I'm going to learn what is GTM, super simple. What is the role of GTM, the problem and the solution. This seems simple. When we talk about GTM, this is the aggregation of marketing, sales and customer success 
resources and functions. That means lead generation, lead development. Marketing can apply to all parts of the customer journey. Sales can apply to multiple parts of the customer journey. Customer success can. I want you to understand that the topic of go-to-market and the aggregation of these three roles under that single nomenclature, that by itself is a major, a major thought change. Most companies don't operate on a, GPM, a GTM. They, they talk about a lead generation function and the lead development and sales. They say, oh, yeah, that's all that's combined is GTM, but they don't run the business like that. Today, what we're going to demonstrate is that we need to start running the business from a GTM perspective, not just from an individual. This is the system approach. That is GTM. What is the role of GTM? Historically, if I ask, hey, what is, what, why do we have marketing, sales, and customer success? And particularly for all of us here in, in, in the SaaS world, in the recurring revenue world, it is primarily and utterly to do nothing but drive revenue growth. Look, I know we're trying to say we need to make customers happy, but for the past decade, let's be honest, that was a secondary, maybe even a tertiary uh, uh, responsibility. And it was a distant second or third, right? The number one thing that most SaaS companies, all these growth companies primarily did, grow at any and all costs. It was not about lowering costs. It was not about improving the quality. It is primarily for most companies as it's always been about revenue growth, do more. And if the cost got lower because of that, fantastic. And if the customer got a better product, fantastic. Primary goal has been revenue growth. What we're going to talk about is the problem that it's created. Now, this problem I spoke about and I have an article on. So those of you who feel like compelled to share this and to you know, write your own topics about it, all you have to do is go to my LinkedIn profile. You click on that article, click share, and you got much of this talk that you can share today with somebody and add some comments or findings or um, debate whether you agree or not. All that is fantastic. It's just, you know, like, like, like share, the, contribute to the conversation. It would be a fantastic part. Okay, here we have it. What we see here, and I'm gonna lower that slightly, come on, come on, like this, squeeze, there, squeeze, there we go. Okay, so what you'll see here, I'm gonna go draw about two axes. Don't look at all the dots yet. Let's first orient ourselves on what axis we have. Down here, horizontally, this is growth. So all the way over there, I have high growth. All the way over th that side, I got low growth. Okay, and you'll see, and I'm, I can squeeze it a little bit more. Like, like, yeah, I'm gonna, there we go. I'm gonna try to get it all in. I see text flowing. Perfect, just making sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so what you'll see here on the left, I got eight to 10% growth, Dropbox and Zoom. This data, publicly available data, we used, you know, like, um, and with thanks to David Spitz from Bench Sites, who provided this, who helped me establish and create this chart, okay? so. On the left, that side, sorry, that side, low growth. On the right, that side, high growth. At the top, very expensive growth costs. What you'll see here on the vertical axis, down here on the left there, you'll see that this is what a company reports as their marketing and sales uh, cost as percentage of revenue is. So you'll see at the top, we're talking about like at this level down here, 60, 70% per dollar made is spent on marketing and sales. At the bottom, we're talking about down here, that line with that arrow, that's 20%, okay? I want you to understand how did now we navigate. So I'm gonna use a couple of examples. Here on the right, what do we got? Sentinel One and Bill.com, obviously, you know, Snowflake. Ah, these are the high-performing, hyper-growth companies sitting there. At the low end down here, we got Dropbox, we got Zoom, we got Adobe, we got Box, we got Zora. Hey, these are the, you know, the, the, the SaaS, uh, how do you call that? The, the call it when you see it like, um, yeah, these are the elite of SaaS. They have been for around, they are like measured in um, you know, multi-billions of dollars of revenue. Obviously they cannot grow as fast as some of these earlier states, you know, like younger companies. But what you'll see is that they have, with that lower arrow there, they have lowered their costs. So they no longer are paying that 60 cents on the dollar to grow. They have lowered the amount of dollars spent on marketing and sales to growth. That is fantastic, right? So it doesn't mean here, whether you're on the left or right, the top or the bottom, doesn't mean that you're in trouble or, or that something bad is going on. 
every position has just a different focus. You need to act and behave in what you need to supposed to be doing down there. So for example, if you are here up on the right and you're growing fast like GitLab, it may be okay that you spend 60 cents on the dollar. Hey, look, if you're growing at, what is it, 70% growth rate? Wow, like that may be worthwhile. I would say that if you're paying 70 cents on the dollar down here and you would have a 10% growth rate, probably not good. Right? Like, and so you'll see that these mature companies are going more to the lower left, yeah? What is happening in the business and what has, as money got more expensive, is that that line, that average gray line is coming down. What is, what is deemed to be too expensive and the average needs to be coming down. So people are spending too much on the acquisition of, more, uh, uh, on the acquisition of clients and or are spending a reasonable amount of clients. On a, they spent the right money, just not growing fast enough. Either I'm, I'm growing too slow or I'm spending too much. One of the two problems. That is the nature of today's conversation. We're going to talk about this. These companies are all starting at 100, but these are all publicly traded companies. All this data is publicly available. This is $100 million, and most of them are in the, there's a whole slew in $400, $500 million ARR. There's a whole bunch between $1 billion and $2 billion. The, the two big ones are Adobe at $17 billion and, and um, Salesforce at $31 billion, right? Some people have said, Jaco, can you make the dot bigger? Based on size, I, I did that, I tried it. It becomes an unreadable chart. So like, like comes complicated. But what I point out to you is like, hey, this case is an ID and a, a point of navigation. This, again, this slide, if you go, if you wanna have a, you wanna click on it, you wanna download it, go to my LinkedIn profile, go to the featured list, you can download it, the slide you can have this data and use it internally if you so choose to, to do so. Just download it from my LinkedIn. Okay, what the change here is, what I'm trying to point out is, remember that revenue growth that I spoke about earlier, right? That, do more, always do more, that what now has changed is, hey, we're no longer looking at revenue growth as the only thing, we're now looking at two more things. We need to lower the cost and we need to improve the quality. I just wanna make sure that we all realize that's the world we live in. Improve the quality, lower the cost. Now I told you at the beginning, hey, well, I asked you to say like, hey, here you're gonna learn these, these things. And so let's see what we've learned. Go to market is, an, is not just a, 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 a word that, or not just an abbreviation, a three letter acronym in Europe. It is becoming an approach. GTM is an approach the same way a lead generation is approached, the same way that lead, lead, uh, a lead development is an approach. Now, all combined, we call GTM. It's a simple statement. For many organizations, they're unable to do that, make that switch today. Next, what is the role of GTM? The role of GTM is no longer to just drive up growth, no longer um, just to do that. What it now also needs to do is increase the quality of the product and quality may increase lead, increase clientele, increase the revenue and so on and so forth, and lower the cost. That is what we're in the world in right now. What is the problem that we're currently running into? Growth is slowing down, quality is going down because pipeline, we have pipeline quality all across and cost is going up. Holy smokes. Yes, that's the crash. That's the problem, right? Others have solved this. We're not the first, like this is good news. We're not the first. So I want everybody to know, okay, I got it, I got it. We now need to solve this. When, you know, like, and we're going to draw this, this analogy on when you start solving this. Now, the way you solve this and, and, and you know, like what I'm going to draw on is I'm going to say is like, we need to install like similar companies that have, the, have had these issues when you are in manufacturing, when you are in software development, when you are in, in services. They have solved this through programs such as Six Sigma, uh, Lean, uh, Kaizen, uh, you could agile for software development. I may have already said that, but you have a whole bunch of these. There's about 21, 20 of these. And they all focus on, hey, make sure that you increase the quality, make sure that you lower costs. Uh, you know, in case of Six Sigma, reduce waste, like skill waste and, and, and so on. And so on. They already solved all this. What we are going to see and what I'm going to show you that the lack of a quality management process that needs to happen for these larger companies. The lack of that is the reason why this costs are so high. 
We are simply have to create a very messy situation. Now, the question is, hey, when do I need to start thinking about implementing this, you know, what we are going to talk about, this quality management process and what it looks like? I mean, like, I'm not at four, some of you may be at 400 million. We have many clients in that. Most have not, well, most, very few have done this right now. And they're all struggling with it. They are implementing it right now. But you're going to see that there's a large group of about 20, 30 of, of the world's leading SaaS companies who are all implementing a form of Six Sigma 4 or Agile for GTM. So where do I start? Do I start at $400 million? Because you know what? $400 million, that's like, you may not be in at revenue. Do I start at $100 million? What we find is that you need to have this in place and fully operational around $70 million. But to take this, have this in place at around $70 million in ARR, you need to take it requires two years to put it in place. You don't just put this in place overnight. It takes two years. If I follow T2, D3 as a rule of thumb for growth, at 70, I'm in the double-double range. So if it takes me two years, then most likely I need to be in the 15 to 16, $17 million range in ARR to start thinking about this. I'm not saying you start to have, okay, let's plug in Six Sigma and let's do this. No, no, no. I'm saying you need to start making it your goal at the end of six to 12 months that you need to have, you need to have started. It's gonna take you two years. If you do not do that, you're gonna end up in this chart in the pink. That's, that's the problem, which means that your valuation is gone because more and more valuation is now dependent on this, right? This is no longer, all oh, you're just in, in the, you know, like, no. High up means that you're unscalable, right? Because you are, you know, like, means scalable, but unsustainable in the blue means, hey, I am growing, but at a relevant perspective and in, 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 in a, in a relatively compared to my cost. So where do I need to start it? I need to have that in place. We know we learned 70. I can tell you why. Why at 70? Because this is where most of your growth starts to shift. Your growth starts to have maneuvered from acquisition to expansion. There's this magical field right around 7 million where we see Nine out of 10 companies, growth from expansion starts to exceed growth from acquisition. That's why. And in order to do that, you need to prepare for that at 15 to 30 million. Many of you don't do that. Many companies don't do that. I shouldn't, I shouldn't make you the guilty one in this. Like, you, you listening to me right now, you did. No, 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 no. <laughs> what I want to point out to you is that where many companies go wrong, where many companies go wrong, that up to 15, 20 million, they're still, you know, they stay focused too long on growth from acquisition. And if that switch doesn't take place and it, and it hasn't happened at 70 million, then you end up in the wrong part. Okay. So that is the situation we find ourselves in. What I'm going to talk about is how are we going to solve this? Now, I need you to, I need us all to understand for a brief moment that we witnessed a miracle at the start of 2020. SAS, immediately helped the world with incredible progress. The world became a better place during the pandemic. Suddenly, everybody all around the world was on SaaS. Uh, but it was via Zoom or via DocuSign or via whatever, it, business, not only business stayed in, in place, communities started to communicate, grandparents started to communicate. Did the cloud fail during this? No, it did not. Did the applications miserably fail during this? No, they did not. I mean, there were some failures, but I mean, like, like considering that a billion dollar, sorry, a billion people suddenly jumped on Zoom, like, think about this. It worked. It worked. Okay. And with recurring revenue, everybody got to participate. Everybody had a seat at the table. Whether you were a student, a teacher, a school, a district, a government, everybody got to participate in this. Recurring revenue made this accessible to each and everyone. Thank you, Stephen Millet. Yeah, <laughs> I see you there. And so what you'll see is that this particular growth that we occurred, SaaS delivered people, it delivered. So where did it go wrong? Where did this all suddenly start to crumble? Where did it break down? What you're going to see, if the internet state you know, did well, if the cloud did well, 
and all the AWSs and the Azures and, and, and the IBM clouds and the Google cloud, all of that worked. It did. All load balancing all over the world, so software applications, all worked. Recurring revenue, everybody paid their $8 a whatever a month, right? All worked. What did it go wrong? Why did this market crash? Why did the financial market crash? Now, we say because money got expensive. It's true. Money got expensive. The problem was not that money got expensive. The problem was that people no longer wanted, since money was now expensive, they no longer wanted to spend it on companies of which the go-to-market model was so, you know, like cost them so much money to acquire customers. So what I'm going to zoom in on is on the go-to-market. What happened if all these pieces worked? What happened in the go-to-market model? What I'm going to divide this, I'm going to divide this and say like, hey, the go-to-market model, you got to think of that in layers. At the bottom, we're going to have the revenue layer. How are we going to charge people? Then we have the data layer. How are we going to measure people? Uh, then we are how we measure the business. The mathematical layer. How does this business work? Where does it accelerate? What is compound? The operating layer. How does all this interconnect? The growth layer. Which stage am I in? And the GTM layer. Which particular go-to-market motion am I using? PLG, enterprise, low touch, high touch, you know, and so on. Six layers. I'm going to step through basically through these six layers for me. To un for and I need, like, I can point you already right now. The operating layer is going to be the problem. But if I if I point you straight away to that and say like the operating layer doesn't exist in today's companies, that is your six sigma. That is your that that's all taking place. And as a result, these GTM layers at the top are all running ragged, right? And as we grow rapidly through the stages, it amplifies this. That's what the operating layer. The lack of the operating layer is a problem. I'm going to explain that to you, but I'm going to briefly explain to you how these things work. Some of you may not have seen this before. So for that, for you, I'm gonna just, in the next five minutes, I'm gonna step you through each of these layers. The revenue layer. The revenue layer, historically, we used kind of like two models. We had, on the one end, we had the ownership model, and the other side, we had the consumption model. The consumption model is the pay phone, put a quarter in the ownership model, buy a car, right? Now, what we see is that we essentially built a, a third dimension to that. We built what we refer to as subscription model. Ownership, I pay up front. Subscription, I pay per month, per year, and so on. And consumption, I pay per usage. I pay per click. I pay per impact, right? When I you know, enter $200 on the, in the FanDuel uh, gaming app. Ownership, generally, always driven by deal size. Big deals, you know, 100,000, million dollar deals, right? This is where I grew up in selling multi-million dollar satellite earthling station equipment. Subscription is all about velocity. I need a lot of volume, relatively speaking, compared to ownership, and therefore I need velocity. SDRs, AEs, PLG, startup motions, fast, fast. Give me that speed. Offering, measuring, the sales cycle is measured in days rather than in, in quarters or years. If I go to the right, it's all volume. I need millions of users, right? I need PLG, I need like, a, hundreds of users inside a company um, and so on and so forth. Consumer space really takes place, you know, all on that right side. Netflix with, you know, like, what is it? Millions? I would, I must have hundreds of millions of users right now. Three models. What you'll see and what I'm going to try to explain that something happened in that model. In that model, if you go from left to right, and if you keep moving along these, or this arc, you'll see the, things change. Win rate change. For example, win rate on the left is one to three. Win rate all the way on the right is one to eight. You can see changes, more and more changes are happening. Sales cycle on the left, quarters. On the right, no cure, no pay. I'm talking about microseconds. Why is this shift in revenue model ch change, uh, changing? Because the buyer's risk is changing. On the left, the buyer takes, uh, takes on the, uh, the, uh, the risk. On the right, the seller takes on the risk. On the, on the left, in pay up front, sellers sell the value of your product which is a promise that the customer can achieve the impact. You buy the car and I promise you, you can drive yourself to work with it. On the right, customers buying impact, all impact. Get me, you know, it's an Uber ride. Deliver me to the office, please. Revenue layer, what you're going to see, most of us still completely <laughs> blame the venture capitalists, like, right? Especially if they're on the, on, on the chat, like, like, like blame Steven. Let's just separate it out. Let's blame Stephen, blame Stephen for everything. So what you'll see down here, many of us are still operating in the really in the ownership model, the way we comp our salespeople, the way we talk about value proposals. Everything is geared towards that. 
This is reflected in many cases by the marketing and sales funnel. The marketing and sales funnel focused on that left and was was came to be because of that. It's very acquisition focused. It's a linear mindset to generate twice as much revenue. I'm going to need twice as many leads. There's always this demand for more, more, more. It is one directional. Starts at the top, flows at the bottom. Primarily churn. Don't lose the deals I just won. NPS score. It's me too. Me too. It's my the me tour. But if I see that people want to you know, have more NPS, it's always the me tour. NPS is fantastic. That's not the point. The point is there's more to it than this. Many of you, you already know this. This is referred to as the bow tie. And as I depict down here, the bow tie is a balanced approach in which we pay equal attention, both from a data perspective, as well as from a process perspective to both acquisition and expansion. What you'll see that the first principle of growth in a model where we're selling perpetual is primarily based on win more deals and you shall grow faster, win bigger deals and you shall grow faster. However, when we move to a recurring revenue business, we notice that growth is not only coming from acquisition, but also from expansion. That means that the first principle of growth between an organization that is based on selling perpetual software and on-prem hardware is very different than that of sales a subscription. In a subscription-based model, revenue can come from upsells, cross-sells, resells, and so on. And yes, also from acquisition. This means that in generally, we have to look at the mathematics behind it because what we're, what we're going to see, and I'll, I'll leave it at a very light touch today, that the mathematical, that growth mathematically from what is called the left side of the boat, that acquisition, it grows slower than what comes from the right side because there's a compound relationship. It repeats itself over time. Historically, what we see is that because companies are in the wrong model, they operate as if they're in, in, in the, um, ownership model, they have only a marketing and sales funnel to represent the growth of which recurring revenue takes place entirely out of the purview of the marketing and sales funnel. Therefore, they miss out on the concept of how you grow and compound. And as a result, these companies have a, take much longer to become successful. They need to be almost successful as a, as a, by accident. And believe me, and I say this, and I forgot who, who, uh, who had a tweet about this. I retweeted it, but God, who was it? He stated in his tweet, listening to, to, uh, listening to CEOs who are successful or founders who are successful is like listening to somebody explaining uh, how they won the lottery. And that is in many cases the place. We run, you, you folks know, I've done hundreds of companies. You know, like we have now run like probably close to a thousand companies, a little over 900. I'm telling you, most of the time, they, they kind of like know and they know their customer but they don't really know how the engine builds and even operates. It's almost like, like they're lucky. Not everybody, I'm not saying that, but you know. What I'm going to depict is that essentially, there are only two revenue moments that, that you transfer revenue, right at the end of that faster and right at the end of that longer. I use a volume, right? Volume of leads. I multiply it by some conversion rates, blue, 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 and I get, I win my acquisition. I take my current accounts, I, increase my retention, I upsell more, multiply, multiply, I get more money at the back end. These are the two motions. On the left, get more leads, move through them. On the right, you know, build my customer out more. On the left, all about going faster. On the right, all about extending longer, longer lifetime, bigger deals. On the left, super speed. Model works differently. I don't want you to need you to know the details of it. I go like, Jocko, this, these left and the right, side, they don't operate the same way. And as I pointed out to you, on the left is how we historically grow ownership. On the right is how we historic or how we are growing um, uh, fast in SaaS. What next I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to the top. Look where I'm going. I had the three layers at the bottom. Boom, I'm now going to the top layer. Okay. At the top is where we, as GTM people, we integrate. We operate on GTM day in, day out. We have GTM motions, we have marketing campaigns, we have customer success uh, a place, you know, like we run sales uh, processes and so on. As you many of you may know, we have seen this commonly before, horizontally, the annual contract value, vertically, the volume of deals. And as you draw between these two, we have on the left, the ideally suited for high volume, high volume and is measured in the hundreds of thousands at a relatively low dollar value, hundreds-ish dollar value, PLG can be a good starter position. PLG can go up, 
Don't know. You'll see that in a second, but that, that's where PLG started. On the right, named account, NAM, named accounts. These are, I used to run for VeriSign. I used to be responsible for a short while for, account, for all of Disney. That included all the 15 business units that they had in that realm, right? And so, uh, you know, like for John Donovan in those days, you know, like I built a, a proposal and named the counter proposal for Disney to sell to Disney and you know, like whatever it was, a $50 million deal in those days. In between, you see inside sales wrap and SDR and AE and enterprise. Some of you may load this as low touch, uh, no touch, PLG, low touch, which is you know, like, like a PLG motion with a slight touch or high touch, multiple people touching the deal like in an SDR and AE. Right now, what you'll see here is that historically, up to a few, I would say sometimes a few months ago, but you know, like no more than a few years ago, it looked like this. But today, you're going to see it has moved. And let me give you that one more time. See how that grows? That motion. We see, and I'm going to do it again. So, like, like because I know you were working on your email, you go, like, "Crap, what is he showing?" Yes. Here, see this. Check it out. This happened. PLG expanded. See that? And an enterprise got slightly bigger. What you see here is the squeeze on particularly that SDRAE role. That is what we're experiencing. Doesn't mean that SDR and AE doesn't work. It does work, but in a, in, when you apply it the correct way, it's no longer the hammer that we used to work with between what, 2015 and 2020. It was simply a hammer we use, right? It's becoming a more sophisticated tool, apply it correctly. Today, you'll see that PLG is becoming more of a, a, a use and i'm like i don't even want to start the topic of plg because definitely it's not a marketing campaign neither is it's it's a sales methodology but for today let's keep it at this okay what we see however is that as these motions are, are are changing we see that significant issues are occurring we now see that plg suddenly has to deal with a higher churn rate early on it was so exciting plg low cost use your customers as your marketing and sales motions fantastic lower my cost now, churn is coming up. Why? Because historically, PLG also did its own customer success. And when you're, when you're trying to get 10,000 users, that may work. Or when you're trying to get 200,000 users, that may no longer work. Win rate on the enterprise. We've seen the growth of enterprise to take over and more enterprise selling going into the lower ACVs. We see that the win rate has started to come down. Historically, enterprise win rate was 30%. Now we see, and as you've seen some of it, during Q1, we have started to witness an average of 17% win rate on enterprise. Well, I wonder why. Well, if you go start selling at $20,000 using enterprise sales uh, motions, of course, you're going to hit that one in five uh, uh, win rate. What we see is that the cost as a result here at the bottom is being severely affected because of that. Again, cost goes up. Now we're paying 60 cents on the dollar to grow. Next, what I'm going to try to explain I'm going to say is like, look, every time that you grew up and you went from one school to another, the rules changed from when you maneuvered from one school to another. The game changed. At a certain part, if you go like, like when you were in, in, in high school, it's all about a popularity context, uh, a, a contest. But when you go to university, it's all about teamwork. Right? And when you go into a company, it's all about performance and deliverable. Every time you move through life, every few years, the game totally changed. The rules changed as a result. So too, as we go from startup to scale up to grown up and to enterprise. These four stages have one thing in common. All of you are on the call, either have been a startup, are a startup. If you have been a startup, you're now a scale up. And if you're being a scale up, you're now a grown up. You grow through this. Each of these stages have their own unique requirements and their own things. What made you successful in college does not necessarily make you successful in the business world. Same here, what makes you successful in a startup does not necessarily make you successful in scale up or grown up. And sometimes that is very easy to understand because if I tell you founder led sales organization do well up to three, $4 million, but a founder led sales organization that doesn't transition out of founder led does not make it up to 20 million. What you see here, this particular, I'm gonna zoom, I'm gonna go there. Okay, what you see here in startup, you often run one to two GTM motions, meaning you may have an annual subscription uh, supplemented with a monthly subscription or something like that, two GTM motions. As you become a scale-up or a grown-up, you start to expand it. Now you have partner sales, you have ch sales channels, you have PLG motion, you have an enterprise motion. I mean, like 
it becomes like you have many different motions. You start to, when you look at a company at 50, 60, 70 million dollars, we're looking at like a slew of different motions, five, six, seven different motions. This to me is like me at night trying to increase the volume in the bedroom of the TV. I can't find a freaking remote to do it with. And if I hit the wrong button, then like TV switches off. And this is like, it's like I have so many different remotes and all I want to do is I want to increase the volume, right? Same here of GTM. I got so many different GTMs and all I want to do is I want to increase revenue or increase leads. I don't know what they hit any longer. I don't know. And it's because all these things, they look interoperable. They all have buttons. They all are remotes. They just don't work together with each other. That's the problem. Now, how did that come? And I can explain it to you, but go back, okay? In this growth layer, in startup mode, first 50 people, they don't like processes. They all winging it. They love winging it. They pride themselves on winging it, okay? Now, the first group of people down here, they work really well together, small group, process is not needed. Then this group gets from people like Steven a significant amount of money and probably no, not as much as they used to get amount of money, but they get money. They get 10 million, 20 million. So here these folks out, they go like, look, I got $3 million. A small group of people have done it. We pride ourselves in not having used any established processes. Fantastic. Give me $20 million. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to hire people. I'm going to hire a significant amount of people. And these people are going to come into this company, which has no processes. Okay. Then what they're going to do, they're going to bring the processes from where they came from. So now I got 100 people. Yeah, and generally these startup ends up about 100-ish people, right? I'm now going to go from 20 people to 100 people, no processes, wealth of money, everybody's doing their own thing. And oh, by the way, as I grow, I have a high, I have a high turnover every 70 to 18 months. I bring in new people with new processes and new tools and new this. Folks, this is the problem, right? This is the problem that we're having. This is why all this occurs. What we recommend is one GTM for every $10 million in revenue approximately. So first 10, one, second, then 22, 33. Uh, like you get the idea, right? But still you, you grow. If you do not create a level of integration, you're gonna end up with this. And most of you, you end up with that. Why? That's that. As we went from this one stage of our, of our startup to or scale up, and we went to this, to sell this mode, there was no moment in time that we said, it's like, hey, hang on, wait on a second. We need to change now. No, we just kept tacking on. We keep growing and growing. We, I mean, growth, growth, growth. That was the, the goal, right? Like spend more money. And as a result, what we missed is we missed the entire operating layer. Normally when a factory would be built, it would take a decade or something like that, right? To get to this number. We can get here sometimes in two, three, four years. Important statement for me to make. At $50 million, you are a recurring revenue factory and you need to operate it as a factory. And if you're not establishing a way how to operate that factory that generates recurring revenue at a lower cost, increased quality uh, and higher volume, then you don't, it's a factory and it should adhere to manufacturing processes. That is the operating model. That is that line at the outcome of that, right? That line, is supposed to keep everybody in check, keep all these departments, all these functions aligned, marketing, generating leads with the lead gen campaign and so on and so forth. And what many of us think, and when we look at this, we go like, wow, oh, we're not that far off. You know, like we're pretty doing pretty well, right? We're like, we're, we're, we're you know, like, look at us, like marketing and your know, lead gen campaign, lead development, they're pretty aligned. For those of you who've been around for a bit, no, that's not how it works. Like pretty much this is the, the journey a customer has to step through in order to you know, get to recurring revenue. It's a mess. It's a mess. Like, like nothing operates with you. I mean, folks, we're dealing with large, you know, at about 100 to $200 million. Believe me how often we run into sales organization of which the SMB team is using band. The uh, enterprise team is using some form of medic. Um, Europe uses med picks, like everybody's using their own thing, right? And then tools are different everywhere. Metrics are different. Definitions of MQLs, SQLs, it's all different, right? It's How can you run a factory like that? A factory that is based and built on running it as a system. This is this problem, what you see down here, this is by far the norm. 
This is by far the norm. The amount of companies that run it right are rare, are absolutely rare. What we see, however, that this is rapidly changing. What we are seeing is that, um, you know, like we are very proud of helping many of these companies, that what you see now is we are establishing, the market is establishing, we refer to this as the D dot dot way, the Salesforce way, the, 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 the Dropbox way, the DocuSign way, the HashiCorp way. All these companies are establishing the so-and-so way, a uniform methodology, a standardized data model, and a common language that we all speak the same thing. And as we talk about this model, impact centric, we're gonna use a bow tie to standardize the data. All these things are becoming the new way of working. That's the big idea. That's what's happening. That is what the next decade will look like. That is what you need to start thinking about over the coming months. And in 24, those who establish and establish themselves first in that field will be successful. Those who were first to jump on the count Cloud became success, most successful. Those who first jump into SaaS became most successful. Those who use recurring revenue models became first successful. And therefore, those who fix the GTM problem become the quickest scalable, sustainable, durable, whatever you want to do. In this, GTM is the protagonist of the story. It is no longer the cloud. We have moved on from that. That was past decade. GTM is the protagonist of the story of the next decade. We need to now understand how GTM works, these layers, multiple layers, we understand that we have a lack of uh, an, an, an uniform operating model. And in companies with $50 million and beyond, they moving forward will have something like that. And they will call it the company name way. That is what we're going to see. That brings that arrow down for those companies who are 400. But believe me, as I said, you need to be here. You need to be doing this. These companies have been too late and are trying to recover. It's really hard if you're dependent on growth from acquisition to get that number down, because you can't lay off salespeople and you can't just you know, drop their by, in volume that way, right? I mean, Salesforce is trying to do that, right? Like it's happening, Cloudflare just announced two weeks ago uh, in, a, in a somewhat of a painful way, but you know, like, like this is happening right now. This is happening. These companies are doing it. You're seeing it in your valuations. Valuations are going down. You see it in the way how cost is becoming part of the conversation right now, essentially. You have no answer for this, or if you have no mindset about it, no thought about this, 2024 is gonna be a problem. Now, hey, Jocko, what is this blue arrow to the right? Everything can be, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. Everything can still be solved with growth. It can. You can, if you move to the right and you are in the 60, 70, 80% growth rate, a lot of people will have a lot of patience with your cost. So how am I gonna, if I want to do something quick, going to cost down is going to take me a year to two. What can I do? Can I increase my growth? Yes, you can. What we see and what I'm going to speak about in the last 15 minutes here, we're going to talk about how you maneuver growth, how you accelerate growth right now. And it's a very different picture than what we historically seen. I even dare to say it's a very different picture than we were delivering to our customers over the past decade. We, over the past decade, have been delivering solutions that were primarily focused at establishing the fundamentals of growth in these companies and to go to market motions. Right now, what I'm going to speak to you about is about the actions that you can take. What is the biggest and quickest gain? How to achieve that? What actions forms the quickest impacts? And how do you make each of these actions stick? Let's dive in. So many things I can do, right? How do I shift from AR to NR? Deals are being delayed. You know, like all these uh, discount structure. Where do I start to increase? We have measured across with a sample of over 54,000 opportunities. We've seen what is below average, what it takes, what is average and above average, okay? What we've noticed that those who perform at below average in generally across these 54,000 opportunities measured over the last six months, these sellers, these organizations were structured. They were primarily pitching. Pitching means below average results. Diagnosing, listening to the customer and putting what they want in context of what you offer or what you offer in context of what they want generated a 54% increase in MRR. If on top of that, we are able to navigate the deal, now our sellers are navigating the decision process. Our organization is able to target to 
ABM campaigns, multiple stakeholders. If we do that, we're seeing another increase of 19%. If you multiply that, that means that the top outperforms the bottom at 2x, give or take. Okay. What is the difference here? What is the difference? Pitching, diagnosing, and navigating. Problem here is this. 68% of these sellers, and this was, again, across thousands of sellers, 68% was only able to pitch. 28% was able to diagnose, express that in what we measured in their, in their Salesforce entries. And 4% was able to explain how they navigated the deal. That's the problem. This build group has grown so big over the past years. And it all came from that middle group. Look, top performers are top performers. They don't need training. I, you know, like they, they, they are often front in class. They use training, but they are going to be successful nevertheless. But that middle group, we see a huge draw fallback from that 28% to that 68%. I'm saying it out loud. I want you to know this. I'm a big believer in this. The last decade of the golden age was known about freewheeling. The next decade will be known about discipline. Those organizations that can implement processes and execute against that in the, and discipline is not a bad word here. It's not being disciplined. Discipline is what makes superstars superstar. Discipline is execute, execute, execute. We're going to see that change. Out of that 68%, that 68% out of that, approximately was it 28, not 20, it was 32% of that 68%, 32%, we should fire right away or we should, reassign because those people did not perform at all. If I put that in people, listen to the following. If you have a team of 25 people, that means seven of those 25 can on average across the 50,000 plus that we've seen, seven of those 15, seven of those 25 can be reassigned. No problem to the organization whatsoever. No problem. What we see that about 10, 11, it's about 10 and a half, 10 to 11, which are currently pitching. And then the diagnosing, which is about like six or seven are doing that. And the navigating is about only one. Instead of percentage, I just turned that into a team of 25. I can drop the cost. I can drop and reassign these people, drop the cost by 28% out of those 25. I can lose seven and not lose sales. If I train a small group and step up the ability to diagnose, I use it as a simple, there's a lot more to it, but my point is do that, an increase of 30%. That means, I can reduce cost by 28% and increase revenue by 30% simply by focusing on this ex the ability to execute. This ability to execute is no longer perceived as training. The mindset of training is no longer making these people effective, particularly the mindset of training at the beginning of the year. What we are looking at is that we are looking at shorter training instead of multiple skills, focus on training on one single skill. Then coach, 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 coach. Weekly, this making it stick is way more important than making them certify and train. The mindset of you've passed certification is no longer, has never been, but you know, like since we were in the golden age, hey, it worked. Now that no longer works. This coaching takes place every week, one to two hours, can either be done as a small group on their own, can be done under the, the leadership of a coach, or can be a coach sharing your results with a larger group but needs to be performed. We refer to these as sprints. Many of you who are CEOs or founders will recognize this from what you're already doing in engineering. No different down here. When you multiply sprints, sprint again is a single task that you train, deliver, coach, implement over a three months time frame. If you do that, you're gonna get compound impact. You train every quarter, one skill. Every quarter, one skill. Next quarter, next skill, following quarter, next skill. This is the way how you're going to get impact. You have the summer to start thinking about this, which one you should do, and to get started. So by the end, if you're doing this right, Q3, Q4, you can get trained to people two skills. We at Winning by Design love to help you with it. That's not the point. You can have an internal person do that. You know, like I'm not here trying to sell you something. I'm trying to, well, I'm trying to convince you like, Training once a year at the beginning of the year won't work and training in, in a large volume won't work. You've got to bring this back to one skill per quarter. What we have noticed is these five skills 
are the most impactful skills. For those of you who are doing large dollar value sales, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, and so on, jolt with their indecision, we have seen an increase in win rate of approximately 10%. Decision complexity, how to navigate an organization due to the CFO involvement, plus 10%. Discounting, huge impact, huge impact. Why? Because when they are losing few, when they are starting to lose more and more deals, they are starting to come to the conclusion or deals are being delayed, they're countering that with discounting. So while we're winning fewer deals, we're winning them at lower cost because the sales team is trying to take corrective action by discounting. Diagnosing, the ability to diagnose impact, plus 40, 54%. This is such a gargantuous number because so many people are not doing it. And lead conversion from 9% to 23% when we help our sellers to become lead developers, not lead generators, but helping our sellers to use their customers to generate new leads has an increase of a nine to 23 performance at, at their customers. This is what we're trying to do. How are you doing it? Use sprints, train one skill per quarter, coach to make that one thing stick, rinse and repeat next quarter. That's the way how we're gonna get through the end of this year and how we're going to approach and set up 2024 color equity. That is it, people. That is it. It's that simple, Jaco. It is that simple. What I want to point out to you down here is in order for you to, 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 to now start bringing this to the company and start thinking about it, I want you to think about sharing two articles with your peers in the management team. Share the article, Sweet Spot in the Eye of the Storm. I know it's a big read, but it's the article that LinkedIn has done an article about right now. Uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review hasn't done an article right now. Like you said, and if it's too much, Probably better, Sari, that, that, that they share the rebirth of the SaaS article, right? Like, because it's a little shorter and get more to the point. And it validates that these efforts are happening on these larger, on a larger scale. Next, a strategic initiative by you and your executive team to start thinking about the operating model, the dot, the dot, dot way. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to do this? This cannot be just like a single department doing. This is absolutely teamwork. The, this, this doesn't go without teamwork. But if you are seeing this, and I would suggest the following as an executive on this call today, get your team together, watch this video, go sit in a room and define your operating model. And believe me, we can provide you with content so you can go and feel free to reach out. We'll help you to get started. But you need to, under, you need to build your operating model if you're at 20, $30 million range. Now, let me tell you this. If you're at $5 million range, people don't do that, okay? Go sell, go acquire, go grow. You, know, like, you don't need process to inhibit you, but know that at some point, at around 15 to $20 million, you need to start making that shift. You can't keep growing and go like, ah, oh, this is fantastic. It will stop working and your valuation will drop. You won't get money. You won't be able to do it. And then lastly, for those of you who want to get started right away, go like, let's start with impact sprints. There is no pain in this. It has an immediate area of, of, of impact on you. Your current growth, that what you're currently doing, if you can grow, go take market share. If you cannot grow, this is a market that you can take market share. Growth and growth rate are a reflection of market share. So since you may not be able to grow, you can grow market share. Your impact sprints will help you with that. With that said, and five minutes early, I decide, yes! Let's do this. Okay. Uh, for those of you who have questions, uh, feel free to ask, put them in the chat. For those of you who have been patiently waiting on this session today, feel free. This is your time to bow out. I'm going to stop the recording and then uh, open it up for a few questions for other that, that people may have. But for those of you who are, who are bowing out, thank you for being here today. It has been a fantastic, it's been a pleasure and a treat. Go make this summer fantastic summer. Speak to you. Bye-bye. And recording.